It's downtown Montreal, St. Catherine Street. The pandemic is raging through the town, one that would take more than 5,000 lives. Crowds take to the street in protest of the heavy-handed government regulations. Statues are torn down, windows are broken, the whole city is taken by surprise. Riders are suspicious of the international powers that be. It's both anti-scientific and anti-vaccination. Strong national feelings permeate throughout them. But it's not COVID, it's 1885. This was the Red Death. Ooh. In another episode of Montreal, rowdiest city on the continent, I was walking down St. Catherine the other day on my way to film a bunch of bike lanes that I have heard are sexist. I'm not gonna try to explain that now. But coming down the road, you could see a whole bunch of flags. Quebec flags, American flags. It was pretty obvious from a distance that we had a bunch of yahoos situation. And yeah, this protest was crazy, but Montreal, we have been here before. In March 1885, a patient called George Longley, a railway conductor, presented himself at Hotel Dieu. At the time, the nuns asked, Oh, why here? Why did you not go to Montreal General, given that you're an Anglophone Protestant? But Montreal General had rejected him. So why would the nuns be praying especially hard that night? Well, with disease outbreaks at that time, you had kind of tears. Polio? That comes during the summer. It's dangerous for kids. We would keep them isolated. Cholera? Well, Montreal had had that a few times, caused by poor sanitation. We fixed the sewer system. But the rare death was caused by the human killer. The apex microbial predator for our species. Smallpox. Smallpox just killed and killed and killed. Every year, hundreds of thousands of people. COVID has a fatality rate of, you know, a few percent and mostly affects the elderly. Smallpox has a fatality rate of around 30% and mostly kills children. Then if you lived, lucky you. There's a third of a chance you're blind. The once in a century event, the Spanish flu, which is often considered the worst case scenario for influenza, killed maybe 50 million people. In one century, smallpox killed 500 million. By the end of April, it was tearing through the hospital wards, but it had been held in check so far. Prior to June 1st, a single case existed outside of a hospital, but large processions came together for the funeral of Bishop Bourget and the annual procession de la Fête du. Catholics, gonna Catholic. Especially back in the day when Jesus existed. Luckily, a vaccine also existed. Unluckily though, the vaccine and the research around the inoculation were a largely English innovation. The smallpox vaccine story is easily the most famous one in history, and it was very early. It even predated one of the greatest French scientists, Louis Pasteur, who created germ theory. So it was kind of crazy. Scientists didn't know how vaccines worked, but they didn't know they worked. The vaccine for smallpox arrived in Newfoundland way back in 1798. This technique had not only proven itself a game changer, thanks to the work of Louis Pasteur, the mysterious mechanism behind it was starting to be understood. You know those oddly satisfying videos where everything just like fits together perfectly? Well, that's how good science works too. You have two scientists in different countries, you know, at different times, and everything kind of builds towards the same conclusion and just fits perfectly. In this case, it's a conclusion that we take for granted today, you know, how the immune system works. But public distrust back then was very high. Remember how the Anglophone elites rejected the Anglophone patient and made it someone else's problem? Well, that sort of bullshit was happening every single day. The French were constantly irritated by the Anglophone elite and treated like second-class citizens. Meh, you clean it up, you deal with it. Taking the role of chloroquine during this pandemic, homeopaths did a better job at connecting with the French-speaking population than the English authorities at the time. Vaccines are an English invention that'll kill you. We have the real solution, shazam! It's called bullshit. Actually, it's not bullshit, it's water. Among other things, vaccines in this era were said to be grease taken from the heel of horses. The newspapers were happy to print whatever, and there was constant recommending of herbal remedies. I mean, check out the ads beside the article on the pandemic. Hall's Vegetable Sicilian Hair Renewer. Bad hair, it's a crime! Lunny's Cod Liver Oil Cream. It's like our cod liver oil technology has regressed. Kidney wart. Cleansing the blood. Also latching on to the whole controversy. Get vaccinated and use Townsend's Pure Bedding be secure from all contagious diseases. High threat count, low probability of that impossible achievement. And uh, parallel bars. I need some of those. 
Need. While the francophone population was being misled by literal snake oil salesmen in their newspapers, the anglophones were getting a totally different experience. They were taking health advice. It was as natural for an Irishman to vaccinate his child as to eat his dinner. But the papers were rife with stories about irresponsible Canadians avoiding vaccination and walking around contagious, clearly affected by smallpox. Did they think? Hmm, the poverty and lack of education that caused this uninformed behavior could be fixed. Fixed by someone, they would have to be powerful and in charge of decision making and education and fixing social ills and responsible for the community. But personally, it just feels better to call half the population stupid and call it a day. There's another common theme that disruptive pandemics often have, playing down the virus and playing up the risk of the vaccine. On a exagéré à plaisir les dangers et les accidents actuels pour aboutir à quoi? À grossir la peur bleue que fait toujours cette maladie aux populations anglo-saxonnes et à montrer la lâcheté qu'elle leur inspire. So they're getting that no big deal, it's just a cold virus. This isn't that bad. They want you to be scared because insert political goal treatment. They did this about smallpox. Smallpox. If you can play the no big deal card about a vaccine preventable baby killer, then we can reliably say that the contagious disease no big deal crowd will make an appearance at virtually any outbreak. And further down, you kind of see that risk calculus problem. De ne pas faire vacciner ses enfants. La vaccine n'est pas seulement une opération répugnante, c'est aussi une pratique dangereuse qui a inoculé des maladies abominables à un grand nombre d'enfants de Montréal. Now, vaccines have saved more lives than just about anything. And this experience is just a small slice of what life just used to be like for people. When polio, measles, mumps would just blow through every single season. Parents would be like, oh, polio's in the air, bring kids inside. But the further back you go in time, the less safeguards there were on medicine in general. I mean, you know, your mercury used for treatments, bloodletting, and all sorts of crazy shit. I think it's been about 70 years since the last bad vaccine in Canada. But in the early days, the chances of it happening were way, way higher, of course. And one of those times that there was a bad vaccine was during this very outbreak, which really sowed mistrust in the population. I mean, even educated Francophone doctors. And a bad batch of vaccine turned this from a hard sell, communications-wise, to a total disaster. Often with anti-vaccination people, what is off is their risk calculus. There are always risks to almost any medical intervention. You know, for example, when you get an x-ray, you're exposed to a certain amount of radiation. Back in the early days, vaccines were still totally worth it, but the risks were a lot higher. And this time, yet again, the anti-vaccination crowd showed up with terrible risk calculus. Between the poverty and the misinformation, by the end of the pandemic, Nine out of 10 victims were French speaking. Most of them were children. Yet on top of all of this, there was another highly relatable thing going on for those living through 2020. Leading up to the day of the riot and President reporting from the time is an immense amount of contempt for several institutions. The first was the police. There were constant reports of sanitation constables attacked by mobs of people, of people criticizing them as lazy, cruel, and dangerous. You have one story of a woman whose husband had come down with smallpox and he had deliriously wandered outside of his house in the rain. And she ran to the nearby police station and she pleaded with the officers, you know, please help me get my husband back in my house, he's fucking lost his mind. And they said, no, that's not our job, that's a medical thing. And she spent the night crying over the dead body of her husband uh, lying in the street and was found the next morning. It's fucking appalling. James McShane was an Irish counselor from the time and quite a character. He said this just a couple of days before the riot. The whole police system was rotten. The force were a pack of lazy vagabonds and 30 or 40 could be seen almost at any time lounging around the central station while their officers sat in their chairs doing nothing instead of helping the citizens who were bravely doing battle with the disease. He continued. Four or five of them in when they got together were able to club some unfortunate wretch. They were also able to watch their chance to go into low shabines and get drunk and then brag about arresting some unfortunate only a little less drunk than themselves. One of the saddest parts of nationalism is that it often emphasizes a few differences instead of the millions of commonalities that we have as people. The poor Irish neighborhood and the poor French neighborhoods had a lot of common causes, but they couldn't seem to work together. So we have serious systematic problems with the police, but we also have systematic issues with the health committee. 
The health committee was in the crosshairs because they were the administrator of these vaccines. And they would publicly shame people with these placards on their doors, you know, like, these people suck. The government also distributed a CERB at the time. And uh, it was a little bit different. That support? Wines, spirits, sago, arrowroot, oysters, and fruit. Family got smallpox. Husband dying in the street. <laughs> Here's a grand bouteille de alcohol pour toi et ta famille. You see the gasoline? You see the match? The day before the riot, Honoré Bourgrand of subway station fame wrote a letter to the chief of police, Monsieur Paradis, which effectively was the 1900s version of nut up and shut up. The mayor had literally come across health officials trying to remove three smallpox cases from a house. A woman with an axe at the head of the stairway threatened and a rough crowd was gathering. The mayor was basically like, where the fuck are the cops? Axe lady? Rough crowds? So Honoré Bourgrand went with fellow councillor Raymond Prefortin to the police station. It's really funny because uh, stories from this era kind of sound like subway stations have these very rich social lives. Hey Henri, you uh, lonely way out on the end there? Rumble, rumble, rumble. <laughs> anyway, the Green Line crew arrived at the police station to rustle up some cops to deal with X lady and rough crowds and found no one in charge. <laughs> I think he uh, snapped, you know, had a, we've had enough of this bullshit time. So he wrote a letter to Monsieur Paradis, the chief of police and the city council. He had to write this letter because he was sick with flu-like symptoms. Hmm, which does make me kind of wonder. Hi, Mr. Mayor, we're a rough crowd full of smallpox. So at the council meeting hours before the riot, acting Anglophone Mayor Ray took over the mayor responsibilities of running the council meeting. The city clerk commenced a meeting by reading his letter to the council as a first order of affairs, and it was resisted at first, but uh, eventually it got read. A sign of problems to come in this incredibly dysfunctional council meeting. Here is part of a letter. You will suspend from their functions the sergeant who was absent from duty at the time the sanitary officers visited the central station. An investigation will be held shortly and justice will be given to whom it is due. And further down, the mayor further requests a personal inspection of the police force to see that they are vaccinated and a refusal to revaccinate will be cause for dismissal. Someone get that man a subway station. No, no. Make it a terminus. Jacques Granier then addressed council saying, The force was good and better than that of any city in the world, the man being brave and devoted. McShane basically then said, What the fuck are you talking about? Councillors had more letters than ever showing that the chief and his organization failed to do their duty. It was not his place to scratch the backs of policemen. He then went on, They had lots of detectives, but what did they do? Arrest little boys and old women. The letter from Honoré was written to say, once and for all, guys, in a pandemic, this is your job. Go get vaccinated and get out there supporting our healthcare workers. Grenier then said that the reason McShane was so hard on the chief of police, Monsieur Baradie, was because he was a francophone. The chief did his duty, in fact. He was the best chief Montreal has seen since she had been a city. Montreal is a lady. A lady with 300 years of identity politics issues, it seems. Well, McShane begged to disagree and responded that the police system was in fact a disgrace. Fucking embarrassing! This caused a substantial squabble between McShane and Grenier, so much so that the uh, mayor ruled the whole question out of order. So instead of the city council endorsing a rational message to the police to take on a task during a pandemic, to lead by example and be vaccinated, to admit that the police force were doing a kind of shitty job, the entire issue was basically rejected. The acting mayor thought the issue was put to rest, but simply put the match closer to the gasoline. Later in the meeting, a letter was read about a member of the health board resigning, which triggered, I guess, the Alex Jones of the city council meeting to pipe up. Alderman Ranville appeared to think this a good opportunity to get in a word on the smallpox question. He stated that, Meh. Another proof of the bad order in which vaccination was held was the riot that morning on St. Catherine Street East. All doctors admitted that vaccination was hurtful. Cries of no, no, oh. This caused a massive debate to break out about mandatory vaccination. The public were under a false impression as regarded compulsory vaccination. 
What was proposed was isolation as far as possible. Children were not to be taken from their mothers by force, neither was it the intention to force revaccination. Councillor Stevenson, who had been watching all of this going on for three hours at this point, said that he had seen city councillors in the past criticise the press, but the inaction of the council that afternoon justified anything the press might say or had said when one saw a list of 238 deaths within a period of seven days. Adjusting for a population that would be like 4,000 deaths a week for Montreal today. The council should at once have extended a helping hand to those poor dying creatures, yet it had wasted from three until quarter past six o'clock and nothing had been gained but obstruction. This is the toxic and unproductive political backdrop to the events of that evening. From the Daily Witness. The trouble in the afternoon was caused by an attempt to affix a placard to the house of a resident of Visitation Street who had the disease in his family. These placards declared the residents infected and often triggered mandatory disinfection and sometimes vaccination. His wife tore the placard which a sanitary officer was preparing to put up and the row followed. Luckily reinforcements did show up. The best police chief in charge of the best police force in the world. Watch out, crowd! Here comes Monsieur Paradis! Mr. Paradis also visited the scene and counseled quietness on the part of the populace. Or not! The police and chief were then taunted and howled at and threatened by the loiterers who stood about and who seemed to hold the police force in as much terror as children do lampposts. <laughs> the mob swelled to thousands of people. Sounds like the crowd were hitting the old liquid serb. It then started moving, first towards the health office. The hoots and yells were redoubled and then the first stone went through the windows of the health office. In an instant, the windows were smashed to pieces and doors were broken open. The ringleaders rushed in and smashed chairs and everything that could be smashed. They left nothing but the bare walls. Then the establishment took a hit. The crowd then turned further on and reached the residence of Dr. Leberge, the health officer whose course has been so firm during the whole smallpox trouble. They threatened to break down the building and smashed a window. So the health establishment took a beating, but so did someone else. The cry was, to the city hall. The crowd passed down saint Denis Street, and when Alderman Ronier's house was reached, they stopped and discharged a volley of stones, breaking windows and threatening to wreck the place. Old council police defender got a couple of stones as well. Also, the Herald and Morning Star, the fake news of the time it seemed, at least the fake news according to the crowd, they were stones, uh, so the police headed down there to defend them. But most of the crowd headed towards City Hall. The crowd thinned rapidly as it reached Notre Dame Street, and at that time seemed to be composed, for the most part, of boys between the age of 12 and 18 years. The youthful antifa of the time, I guess. On arriving at City Hall, the rioters exchanged fire with, like, revolvers out of the windows. I'm picturing a bureaucrat who's like, I was told government jobs were safe. Both the mayor and the deputy mayor headed to the scene. Apparently the mayor had been having a hot bath to deal with his like sweats or whatever. The deputy mayor Gray telephoned his home and ordered his daughter to take the loaded revolver and empty it into the mob if they should assail his house. Definitely one of those moments where you realize that this was a different time. It was the differentest of times. It was the stupidest of times. Six bullets into the uh, crowd later. That lady's gonna be dead. The whole evening was ended when the military were called in to help the best police force in the world. The day after the riot on the smoldering streets, there were many stories in the newspaper about the shenanigans of the previous night. A large crowd of French Canadians of both sexes were viewing the damaged health department on St. Catherine Street East this morning, and the expression generally was that it was a brave deed. One excited young man, evidently not long out of a bed of smallpox, yelled, Hurrah for the French Canadians, Montreal is no longer for the English nor Irish. A buzz of approval went around, and the young man disappeared into an adjacent salon to drink to his own sentiment. My man. Continuing the slice of life sentiment, on encountering a gossipy milkman, as a reporter was walking up Panay Street, and when near Mignon, he heard a milkman giving several of his customers a dissertation on the evils of vaccination. He said, it has killed several old men that I know, and is especially dangerous for women and children. Que bon? QAnon. Oh. If you're not already kind of blown away by the similarities with the complaints about police and the crazy pseudoscience, how about adding a little bit of fake news? Stories appeared around the world detailing the events of the riot. The article which made me aware of this event actually came from New Zealand and states, the residents of Dr. Uh, bloody uh, La Party was uh, set on fire. Men in the crowd mounted the pedestal of Queen Victoria and demanded to know who should rule the town. 
eliciting the French as an answer. Oh, I reckon. So, well, that stuff, pretty sure it was exaggeration and fake news. Both of these things do remain permanently in the coverage from New Zealand's newspaper archive. And those stories from the witness about the milkman and the drunk kid, someone was heard to say? I mean, come on. The news of the time was rife with this stuff and it was like third-hand accounts of God knows what. People profiting off us being angry at each other has been a long-standing thing. As a local paper put it, Exaggeration is to be deplored at a time like the present, yet under pressure of the nocturnal excitement. Yeah. Both morning papers have yielded to it in detailing last night's riot. One described the Herald office as wrecked, and Dr. Laporte's house as set on fire. Neither report is true. Very likely New York, Chicago, Boston, and other cities will be told today that Montreal is in a state of siege from smallpox rioters, as well as from disease. Such journalism is as bad as rioting, and far worse in the mischief it does. It's crazy reading through these stories. You have uh, nationalism, you have out-of-touch elites, you have policing being questioned, you know, for their effectiveness, and, and maybe even their own crimes. You have the conspiracy theorists, and you, you have the fake news, and news that wants us to all be angry and profits off us hating each other and dividing us. But I think it's actually why Montreal is my favorite city. It has it all. Of course we get one of the largest environmental protests in history, and then one year later a huge anti-establishment COVID protest. If you find humanity interesting, I don't think there's a better vantage point than this city. I looked it up and the term identity politics was coined in 1977, but we've been on the front lines of it in this city for hundreds of years. And get used to it, it's never going to be easy to be Montreal. We just have so much more work to do to get along than other places. I've been reading the Montreal Building Code recently and you know, came across a section on fortifications, but it's not the fortifications that you would think. You know, this is the, the regulatory burden of uh, bikers that bomb separatists in the mafia. Yet still, people flock here from around the world, like this asshole. Even though for most people, Toronto would be so much easier. It's easy to be cynical about all of this, you know, and see people as predictable. And in aggregate, we are. You know, you have inputs like social inequality and linguistic challenges and failures in leadership. Everything is going along, you know, not super smoothly, but it works. Then you throw a global pandemic into the cogs and maybe some social upheaval in our largest economic partner. And those same inputs will pretty reliably and obediently make the same outputs. But I can tell you from the story of Montreal this time, there is something different about this pandemic. We're actually doing better, although it often doesn't feel like it. Do you see people with revolvers shooting into crowds of protesters? That would be fucking stupid, right? Well, in the past, people thought that was a great idea. Do we give booze and oysters to people with a virus? No, oysters are far too expensive. How many politicians have you seen attacked by widows with axes? The proportion of a town back then who refused vaccines and thought it was a conspiracy was much, much higher than it is today. We have improved as a species. And it's not surprising, I mean, people back then were just fucking straight up far less educated. A lot of those people could not even read. We see that same complaining about people not taking masks seriously, but if it was killing a third of a population, I think that even stupid people would be doing the calculus right this time. And despite the disappointment from our shit politicians, the scientific institutions that we've built over the last couple of centuries have been crushing it. Fastest vaccine development in history. Quick, rapidly adapting to information. Research coming in from all corners that like rapidly answers questions that policymakers and politicians didn't even know they needed. Information that people in 1885 could only dream of. And that's what the most encouraging thing is for me, because given that humanity is this predictable machine with predictable outcomes for predictable inputs, all we have to do is tweak the machine and these inputs to, to do better. And the people that study this machine and talk about the inputs and make you know, suggestions to the politicians are the exact same people that have proven themselves during this pandemic. Scientists and researchers. So from Montreal, a city that represents all that is human, the good and the bad. We've been here before, but worse. And we're gonna be here again, but better. 
You know those oddly satisfying videos where everything kind of fits together? <laughs> I'm doing it. Those oddly satisfying videos where... <laughs> anyway. Pornhub! <laughs> All right. Family got smallpox. Husband dying in the street. <laughs> Maybe that's why he wandered out into the rain. He had a bit too much of a CERB. <laughs> but simply put the match closer to the gasoline. Maybe it's corny. Maybe it's not. We'll have to see if it ends up in the edit. <laughs> Telephoned his home and ordered his daughter to take the lo loaded revolver and empty it into the mob. <laughs> That's good.